So we're moving on to secondary hemostasis, which involves the clotting cascade. And so you already went over um, kind of the interplay of vessel walls, platelets, and now we're going to talk about clotting factors. And of course, these three are extremely intertwined. Uh, and the eventual goal is that clotting factors, they work on kind of the backbone of platelets, which adhere to vessel walls, and the clotting factors, these eventually work to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and it's the fibrin clot. When we actually talk about clot production and coagulation, that's what we're talking about. And so something other, otherwise important to realize is that uh, whereas platelets are made in the bone marrow, clotting factors, most of them anyway, are made by the liver. So when we actually talk about liver failure and liver dysfunction, that's going to impact clotting factor production. Some clotting factors are made in endothelial cells and other cells, and we're not really going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to start with talking about the coagulation cascade, and we actually break coagulation into different pathways to allow for testing. There's a tremendous amount of overlap, and it's really complicated, and we're not going to go through the complexities of it. We're really going to talk about how you diagnose clotting diseases, uh, coagulation defects. So a couple things to realize is that, you know, we already talked about platelet number and function, right? So platelet number and function, well, it's true as well for clotting factors. You need a sufficient amount of clotting factor and you need it to function appropriately to actually get um, a clot to form. And decreases in factor amount, just like a decrease in platelet amount, can really lead to bleeding. Um, and we're going to use uh, the pathways to help us identify where the defect is in each pathway. So kind of get out a blank piece of paper is my suggestion, and then we're going to start by drawing a Y. All right, so you should have drawn a Y. It only took me about eight attempts to get my lines straight on my Y. I decided to pause it while I did that. And we're going to draw this Y, and each arm of the Y is going to represent a different pathway we're going to go through the factors involved and how we test each pathway and then mention a few additional considerations. There'll be a separate video on actually test interpretation. So the left arm of the Y is called the intrinsic pathway. So that's our intrinsic pathway. And uh, it is comprised of the following um, path, excuse me, the following factors. And that's factor 12, factor 11, factor 9, and factor 8. And um, a clinical pathologist years ago said this, that it's, imagine if you're shopping at Walmart, it's, nothing's ever rounded to the whole number, so it wouldn't be $12, it's eleven ninety eight. So that's how to remember that. So the next pathway we're going to go to is the extrinsic pathway. And the extrinsic pathway includes um, something called tissue factor. We're just going to abbreviate that TF, which comes from the tissue, and then something called factor 7. And these pathways meet um, sort of at the common pathway. And notice that the extrinsic and intr intrinsic pathways both share the common pathway. So you can't get to the end of the path unless you go via the common pathway. And so the common pathway includes factor 10, factor 5, and then factor 2. And of course, 10 divided by 5 is 2. You just had to remember lucky number 7 in the extrinsic. One of my students years ago came up with this really great way to remember it, and of course I forgot it. Um, so the last thing to realize is actually making the clot. Um, it starts off as fibrinogen. So fibrinogen, which we've talked about, and fibrinogen is converted via factor 2, which I'll tell you what the other name of that is, um, and that's, it gets converted into a fibrin clot. And it starts off as a soluble clot, and then it becomes insoluble. So the other name for factor 2 is actually um, thrombin. That is way too big, sorry about that. Let's try a different... So factor 2 is actually called thrombin. So you may have heard of thrombin before. If not, not to worry. So the other name for, for factor 2 again is thrombin. So a few things, and we're going to go over this many times, 
um, is how we actually test each of these pathways. So how do we test these? Well, the intrinsic pathway, or the tests of the intrinsic pathway, are PTT and ACT. And of course, it the test actually is detecting a clot, so it also includes the common pathway. So it includes both of those. Now the extrinsic and common are tested by PT. And I always remember this because there's only factor seven on the extrinsic side and it's a little bit shorter. Uh, and so PT is a little bit shorter. Uh, there's another test which we use rarely and that's called the thrombin time or the TT or the thrombin clotting time. And that actually just tests the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, so it doesn't really have anything to do with factor two. Okay, one of the last super important things to realize is that some clotting factors are dependent on vitamin K activation, meaning they remain as inactive factors circulating the body until they undergo an important chemical step, which is activation by um, factor, excuse me, by vitamin K. And those factors are factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. And those are our vitamin K dependent factors. And that's going to come into play when we talk about warfarin um, rodenticide. So the last thing I'm going to mention in this lecture, and I'll mention it again, is the cofactor in many of these reactions is calcium. And we use that to our advantage for um, anticoagulants, especially citrate and EDTA. But animals that are hypocalcemic, so low calcium, won't have clotting disorders. There's always enough calcium in the body for clotting. Um, so that is not something you have to worry about in case you see anything about calcium. So low calcium does not equal a clotting disorder unless you're in an anticoagulant tube, and then that will work. Um, that way. So the next lecture is actually going to be on these various tests uh, and the tests that we use for coagulation. But my suggestion is that you kind of keep this why handy or rewrite it because um, I, I find that the more times you see it and the more you're used to it, the easier this gets. Coagulation, I think a lot of is very intimidating for people, but it's actually pretty easy when you break it down into the steps.